Okay, so um, let me go ahead and introduce everybody. Uh, or we're starting at 9.15, right? We still have a couple minutes. Um, yes. Okay. So well, we, I'll wait till 9.15 and introduce everybody, but um, at least everyone can share their screen. Great. All right, everybody, it is 9.15. Uh, we're still working through some technical difficulties with video, so uh, we're, we're not going to have video for a little while, but we will have screen sharing. Um, so welcome to paper session one. I'm Professor Kel Karpinski. I work here in the library at City Tech. Uh, my pronouns are they and he. Um, our, our lineup for the first paper session this morning, um, our first presenter will be Cynthia Lamb. Uh, presentation is Lost in Translation, The Inevitable Gendered Language in Ursula K. Le Guin's The Left Hand of Darkness. After that, we will be followed by Chris Leslie, The Gendered Performance of L. Taylor Hansen, followed by Sinchan Chatterjee, Science Fiction and Post-Gendered Maternity, A Care Ethics-Based Reading of Ursula K. Le Guin's The Left Hand of Darkness. And finally, we will have Marlene S. Barr, uh, on Naomi Alderman's The Power as Jewish Feminist Power Fantasy. Um, each of our presenters will have 10 minutes uh, to present. I will give you a warning when you're at the one minute, um, and then uh, we will uh, have a 10 minute Q&A at the end. Um, if you missed it uh, when Juanette said it before, if you can please try to ask your questions through the Q&A feature, um, the sometimes questions for presenters get lost in the chat. Um, but 
please feel free to use the chat if it's when we figure it out uh, to, to talk with each other um, for general conversation. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Cynthia Lamb. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's a great honor to be first presenter and share my research with all of you. My topic is about the inevitable gender language in the left hand of darkness. In my complete paper, I covered five main points, the criticisms of left hand of darkness and the green sweep uh, responses. And then second, an introduction to the traditional Chinese and Japanese language. Third, examples of the translations of the original text. Fourth, how gender subversiveness has gone missing in the translations of less gendered languages. And finally, how the role of translator can compensate the limitations of the target language and help the readers understand the role will of the story more accurately. Today, I'm going to give you a gist of part one, three, and four. I focus on the most common criticisms of uh, Left Hand of Darkness, which is over Le Guin's insistence on using masculine pronouns, he, him, for the infamously ambisexuals, Genevians. Le Guin initially took a defensive stance against her critics, claiming to use he as a sufficiently neutral or generic pronoun in English, for if she was to invent another by her terms, it would destroy the English language. Laguin's response is intriguing as she therefore suggests that some languages are inherently more gendered than others. She continues this view of gendered language in the afterwards of Le Left Hand of Darkness, saying that uh, English has a truly ungendered pronouns only in the plural. He, she, and it are gendered, they is not. So is the English language indeed the only cause of the inaccurate depictions of ambisexual society as in given, or can the interpretations of Givenians be resolved by reading the book in other languages? As Le Guin puts it in her retort, she envies languages such as Japanese as they actually consist of a he, she pronoun. For this very reason, I turn my exploration of the subject to the widely translated versions of the Left Hand of Darkness published in both Japan and Taiwan, for both Japanese and the traditional Chinese languages are considered to be genderless or less gendered language system linguistically. The purpose of this work shall be to explore and examine if less gendered languages can truly achieve a more accurate depictions or interpretations of an ambisexual society. If the problem of inaccurate depictions uh, truly lies in the core of the gendered languages, uh, as implied at a closer inspection of the works as translated shall either unveil a solution or provide valuable insight into the course. Lagoon's instinct that languages may affect the delivery of a story is not mistaken on her part. Many marked words in English, especially those used by our protagonist, Jenny I, are completely neutralized in both the, Jap uh, in the Chinese and the Japanese translations. One obvious example is the concept of Cameron Sun which is uh, commonly mentioned in chapter eight to 10. And due to the unique biology of the Givanians, they develop sexual organs and sexual drive for only a few days of every month, which is known as Kima. A Givanian in Kima has the hormonal changes to become either male or female without any predisposition to either. So, a Givinian individual can be both a mother to a child or and a father to another. Being trapped in his use of gender dualism, Gini, uh, Jenny I uses Kimmering Sun to describe the children of the flesh. In the traditional Chinese and the Japanese translations, Kimmering Sun is instead translated as the child of Kema. The degendering of the nuns shows a more accurate interpretation of the actual biology of the Givanian and puts a more apt description of the phenomenon of Kima. While both the 
Japanese and traditional Chinese translations do away with gendered language in the interpretations of left hand of darkness, the latter is arguably even more precise and conscious when it comes to depicting the bisexuality of the given news. Specifically, in chapter two, the plot depicts a collection of North Cahedon half tales, a love story between two brothers. The translator tactfully replaces and describes the relationship with a less common but uh, synonyms of genderless term. The first part of the word refers to a brother or sister by blood, and the second part uh, of the word uh, literally means hands and feet, which is often empl employed as a metaphor for siblings. Nevertheless, it can be argued that even with accurate interpretations, queer reading may not necessarily be enhanced. Due to the nature of genderless language, uh, the, the gender subversiveness of the English language can sometimes become quite bland or disappear into the background. The particular phrase in the novel that Lagoon is especially fond of, the king was pregnant uh, in chapter eight, which is also famous for being out of place in terms of gender language. How can a king, in many instances referring to a man, get pregnant? These conspicuous, conspicuous semantic contradictions, although misleading with its gendered language, contrasting, contrastingly remind us of not only the bisexuality of the Givinian, but also demonstrates the limitations of the English language. It forces us to rethink how some words are either necessarily or unnecessarily gendered. In the traditional Chinese translation, it is phrased that the king or the monarch is pregnant. Linguistically, in Chinese, the term is not essentially gender specific. While it is true that it is commonly associated with males, and the Chinese language has another marked word for the female variations, it is not for no other reason than historically there being more kings than queens. As a result, the sense of gender mismatch coming from the king was pregnant does not strike Chinese readers as significantly, thus weakening the interpretations of the Gavinians and bisexuality and androgyny in this instance. A further example of the weakening of queer reading as found in the Chinese and the Japanese translations can also be uh, within, found within the same chapters. When uh, Jenny I arrives in the planet, uh, the commissioner said, treat him as he was he were pregnant. The constant thematic contradictions and misfit once again emphasizes the stark biological contrast between the Ukumen and the Givinians. Much to the queerest readers' dismay, the queerness of these particular scenarios loses its strength in the Chinese translations. The pronoun here can be generic and without gender in the Chinese language, especially in Taiwan, which can uh, be applied liberally regardless of identity. Chinese readers can simply understand the sentence in the most logical and common sense that is treat her as if she was pregnant. And the gender inclusive inclusivity of the pronoun in this sense will still can still leave the door open for Chinese reader to second guess is applied a contest in this scenario, yet it completely disappears in the Japanese version. This is one example of how third person pronouns are not always present in the Japanese language, for it relies heavily on context. The translation literally means treat them as uh, you would treat someone who is pregnant without any gender indicator. To Japanese reader, the sen this sentence alone is as natural as it can be in the real world. I would like to address uh, on the role of translator too, but I don't want to take over the valuable time of other presenters. To briefly conclude, it is evident from uh, the two different translated versions of the novel that the problem still persists, even if we use less gendered language systems. As long as the story itself is being narrated by an outsider who is so far removed from the Gavinian society, the viewership will always be through a gendered lens. Perhaps this is the reason why Lagoon refuses to rewrite the novel with new pronouns and still stand by it 
after years of revisiting the story. Instead, she creates a short sequel to the fictions coming of age in Kahai, in which she avoids the gendered pronouns issues entirely, partly by narrating the story in first person. As such, this is her final answer to all the criticisms regarding the gender of pronouns. The solutions will never be found through the employment of other language systems, but only through the perspective of an, of an insider. That's all for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia. That was fantastic. Um, so next up, we have Chris Leslie, the gender performances of Al Taylor Hansen. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm sorry that I was unable to make a recording of the longer presentation. Uh, I will try to uh, get it done in the next day or two and put it up on my blog, uh, chrislesley.info. Today, I'm going to skip through uh, things pretty quickly just to stay within the time limit. So I apologize for that. Um, so I'm interested in uh, considering the legacy of L. Taylor Hansen, who, hey, why? Um, who was singled out a, a few times uh, for being a person who concealed their gender. Uh, El, um, Eric Devine in his book, Partners of Wonder, uh, says that it's not true that so many people concealed their gender. Uh, Leslie F. Stone and C.L. Moore made it clear that they were women uh, and says that only L. Taylor Hansen uh, concealed their female sex. Uh, and Devine goes as far to say that uh, Raymond Palmer, the editor um, of the Astounding Stories that published a bunch of uh, Hansen's nonfiction articles, conspired with Hansen to conceal their gender. Uh, and uh, in co correspondence with uh, Palmer's son, I did find out that uh, his parents never knew uh, about Hansen's uh, true gender. Uh, and it seems a little bit overstated. Uh, fan historians like Sam Moskowitz have um, made a, very clear statements about Hansen trying to conceal their gender uh, and uh, encyclopedist uh, E.F. Beeler um, is quite rude about Hansen saying that Hansen wasn't really a great author, but the question of her quote unquote, her identity has rendered her interesting. Uh, Lucille, which is her uh, name at birth, was simply a shy uh, authoress. Um, some people have uh, also considered that maybe Hansen was uh, having a psychological crisis. Uh, it's a very uh, straightforward quote in Frankenstein's Daughters by uh, Jane Donaworth. Uh, Hansen was caught in a paradox of authorship and gender, she writes. Hansen was undergoing a crisis of writerly authority as well as a probable social crisis. And this is um, Donaldworth's explanation of why Hansen used male pronouns. Um, and it certainly is true that uh, Hansen presented uh, themselves as a, um, as a man throughout their career. Uh, there is a photo with Hansen's fifth story in 1930 um, in co personal correspondence with uh, Palmer's uh, son. There's a note about how this photo came to be. Hansen said that they wanted to start writing science fiction and uh, Hansen's husband at the time, Fred, said um, that he would have to send in a picture. Uh, and so Hansen went out the next day where uh, his husband was working and, and called him and snapped the picture and sent this picture in that became the, the photograph uh, that uh, looks like a, a man uh, that goes along with the stories. Uh, it is uh, a little bit troublesome, though, that Hansen always used male pronouns uh, throughout their, his career uh, in the seven science fiction stories from 1929 to 42, uh, and in the 50 science nonfiction stories for Astounding. Uh, and then in three publications that came after that um, about anthropology and uh, geology, while Hansen was working on a postgraduate degree. And throughout all of these, Hansen uses a, a male uh, uh, pronoun to refer to themselves. 
Um, and this to me is an important insight into Hansen's work. When we read stories like Hansen's The Men from Space, uh, we find the story begins with a bunch of fraternity brothers who aren't really that smart. And so although they have the privilege of going to school and studying science, um, they uh, don't really seem um, that clever um, in contrast to the superhero men we're used to seeing in Amazing. Um, the Prince of Liars, the frame story is about gentlemen scientists arguing about relativity. Uh, it turns out that they are, um, are, are, their science is much outpaced by ancient Egyptian science. And this a dispute among elite white men uh, is accompanied by the denial that white masculine science is superior. Uh, and later when Hansen was working on uh, degrees in uh, anthropology and geology, the nonfiction articles also sort of take on this uh, masculine culture of science. Um, I like this, um, these comments in Hansen's article, A Scientific Jigsaw Puzzle, that talks about the rich um, population of, of indigenous Americans and how when they present this information to uh, um, colleagues, they often just say that the Native Americans were, were savages. And Hansen is offended, you know, somebody who admires um, the, early, um, uh, the, the, the early culture uh, and gets, Hansen likes to report their revenge when they take them to the uh, history archives and show them the documentation that the astronomers of uh, the indigenous people were actually quite good at what they were doing. Uh, and so again, even after um, the science fiction stories were finished, after um, Hansen has been outed by the fan community, uh, they're still going into this world uh, and with a sort of pugnacious attitude. And even as late as 1963, we can find Hansen's uh, referring to himself as a he, uh, there's an encounter with the Chippewa chief uh, in this book, He Walked the Americas, uh, and very clearly refers to himself as he. He toward him came the college student, which is Hansen, uh, the one of the tribe uh, adopted by blood rights. Uh, the only time that Hansen refers to himself as a woman is actually just with a picture. So in the last uh, publication of all the their research in 1969, the ancient Atlantic. Uh, it starts out with byline Elt Taylor Hansen and, and does not make any contradictions all the way through. But the last page of the book uh, has a picture, a sketch of a woman uh, dated 1942 with the cap caption L, meaning Lucille Taylor Hansen. Uh, and so, and this is sort of a clever way of trying to um, defy audience expectations. And it's sort of a clue to Hansen's public persona of enjoying making people uh, shocked that this uh, renowned um, uh, scholar is actually a woman. Uh, and so for that reason, I sort of um, I'm unhappy with Ackerman, Moskowitz, Bleeler, their unwelcome pursuit of Hansen and their gleeful violence of outing a Hansen's supposedly true sex. Uh, and even people who are more sympathetic to early women in science fiction, like Jane Donnerworth and Eric Devine, talk about Hansen as if uh, they were engaged in some sort of subterfuge in order to um, get some science fiction stories published as if it was some sort of a great prize. Uh, Hansen is a, a scholar in, um, in anthropology and geology, does not really need science fiction publications. Uh, and so considering how important gender performance was to Hansen's fiction and nonfiction. Uh, I went ahead in uh, my book, um, From Hyperspace to Hypertext, and used the masculine pronouns uh, to refer to Hansen, uh, re reflecting their uh, presence or his preference. Uh, and these days, we know enough to respect an author's choice. And I think it's an interesting case um, of sort of gender um, uh, discontinuity. So that's all I have for today. Uh, like I said, I'll try to get a um, longer uh, version with some more details uh, and a video recording later. Thank you guys so much. That was great. Um, so uh, panelists, uh, video seems to be working now. If, if you do want to turn on your video, um, 
So our next presenter is Sinchan Chatterjee on science fiction and post-gendered maternity, a care ethics-based reading of Ursula K. Le Guin's The Left Hand of Darkness. Uh, hi, can you see me and hear me? Uh, I'm here. Yes, yeah, so you can see you. Oh, yeah, uh, so I'll begin. Uh, let me just take a moment to share my screen and see if that's possible. Um, yeah, can you see my screen as well? Yeah. All right. Uh, so my paper is titled Science Fiction and Post-Gendered Maternity. Uh, it's a care ethics-based reading of Ursula K. Le Guin's The Left Hand of Darkness. So in this paper, I will analyze Le Guin's science fiction, The Left Hand of Darkness, using some key concepts of the feminist philosophical lens of care ethics in order to underscore the notion of maternity as envisioned by the author. Employing Sarah Ruddick's concepts delineated in maternal thinking in the context of Le Guin's work, this paper will attempt to question whether maternity itself and not just gender when approached through the feminist theoretical standpoint of care ethics may be understood as a performative act or a set of performative acts to use Judith Butler's concept. Written in the second half of the 20th century, the left hand of darkness foreshadows a world where the very concept of gender does not exist and all individuals are therefore genderless and ambisexual, to quote Le Guin. In this world, the king is depicted as one who is able to become pregnant and conceive a child. In, a in an attempt to bring about a total erasure and a complete erosion of the categories of gender, the text marks a paradigmatic shift in the popular perception of gender, advocating a move away from, as Heilborn points, points out, sexual polarization and the prison of gender. In the queer post-gender society of Gathenians, who, as Le Guin writes, do not see one another as men or women, one is respected and judged only as a human being and not on the basis of arbitrary societal constructs like gender and sexuality. Yeah. Uh, the people inhabiting this land are not men or women, but men-women. In Le Guin's fictional universe, sexual roles are also purely contingent and reversible. And hence, the mother of several children may be the father of several more. In her novel, parental caring is not just the prerogative of women alone. Le Guin notes how in Gethen, no one is tied down to childbearing. Furthermore, as the protagonist Chen Li I believes, the distinction between a maternal and a paternal instinct is scarcely worth making. The parental instinct, the wish to protect, to further, is not a sex-linked characteristic. Sarah Radic also raises the issue in the preface to her book, Maternal Thinking, where she observes, nor is there any reason why mothering work should be distinctly female. Anyone who commits her or himself to responding to the child's demands and makes the work of response a considerable part of her or his life is a mother. This radical understanding of motherhood destroys the gendered notion that only women can be mothers. Radic's idea of maternal work or maternal practice practically serves two purposes. First, it shatters the myth of naturally loving and caring motherhood by focusing on the labor put into acts of mothering. Secondly, it establishes motherhood as a work or a role rather than a fixed identity. Just like in Le Guin's text, Radic also challenges the cultural conditioning and social expectations which would not accommodate motherhood in the narrow, limited notions of masculinity, shattering the lines of gender along which care and care had traditionally so rigidly been stratified. Moreover, the idea of work uh, also problematizes the mother's relationship to their children. Radic identifies maternal practice as a relation and a response to, to quote her, the reality of a biological child in a particular social world. Hence, the link between gender and motherhood is systematically severed, as now it is no longer only women who can perform the role of maternal caring, uh, but also men. Criticizing how mothering has historically been romanticized and reduced to an almost natural instinct for women, much like Leguin does through her work of fiction, Radic debiologizes care 
by noting how maternity is not really a biological impulse, but a role that mothers have to consciously perform. This also enables Radic to formulate birth giving and motherhood as two distinct acts. She further questions the naturalness of the mother child relation by introducing the concept of choice and commitment to participate in an ongoing process involving an organized set of activities to quote Radic. And the renewal, the conscious and constant renewal of that choice. Mothering is no longer seen as an instinctual urge that the biological mother feels for her child. Instead, the commitment of care is an ethical act. It is a commitment that mothers as social beings make to their children as biological beings. Thus, the very idea of the figure of the mother is revolutionized by Radic, just as it is reimagined in Le Guin's science fiction. A cohort of feminist philosophers, critics and theorists have recognized uh, the, uh, how, how the issues of reproduction uh, trends to drive an unbridgeable, an apparently unbridgeable gap between the two genders, and how reproduction puts not just physical and emotional strain on women, but also a socio-cultural pressure. The question of mothering has been further problematized by popular discourses in media representations, films, and advertisements, which reinforce the patriarchal division of gender roles by valorizing the archetypal figure of the all-effacing, benevolent, selfless mother persona, especially in the contemporary Indian scenario. Motherhood is thus a role that is historically imposed on women, sometimes even without their own will. Thus the question of maternal caring as a strictly gendered, exclusively female labor ensures the perpetuation of this gender divide and sustains the hegemonic discourse of patriarchal heteronormative domination. In a cyborg manifesto, Donna Haraway provides an alternative solution to the tyranny of reproduction. She proposes the birth of a post-gender world, a post-biological and post-corporeal civilization, where women will be emancipated from the restraints and biological obligations of childbirth. In such a hypermodern world, characterized by radical technological innovations, such as artificial insemination, parthenogenesis, cloning, and artificial wombs, the burden of reproduction no longer has to be borne by women alone, just as in the world of Gethin. Reproduction becomes a gender neutral activity. Similarly, in Ursula Le Guin's utopian realm, the arbitrary social construct of gender is entirely eradicated as a concept from the sexless world of post-gender subjectivity. The age-old essentialist dualisms, which reinforced a hierarchical mode of thinking and ordering discourses in Western thought, have been, to quote Haraway, cannibalized and techno-digested. In her nonfiction, The Language of the Night, Le Guin spoke about the harmful impact of classifying gender in terms of binaries. Our curse is alienation, she writes, the separation of yang from yin. In the world of Gethin, this curse has been lifted. The yang or the masculine element and the yin or the feminine element have been reconciled and united in the Taoist sense, establishing perfect harmony and concord throughout the land. As Barbara Brown argues in her essay, The Left Hand of Darkness, Androgyny, Future, Present, Past, the unification of all these dualities, the acceptance of these ambiguities, prepares both Jen Li and the reader to accept the central thematic unity of the sexual hermaphroditism of the Gethenians. To conclude, therefore, Ursula Le Guin's text, when read through the feminist philosophical perspective of care ethics, not only deconstructs the gender binary, but also debiologizes the idea of maternity as a gendered activity. Her work thus marks a departure from the traditional structuralist mode of thinking about gender and motherhood as unchangeable markers of identity to a post-structuralist conception of mother and maternal identity as essentially fluid and provisional roles. So, thank you. Thank you, that was fantastic. All right, our last presenter up is Marlene F. Barr on Naomi Alderman's The Power as Jewish Feminist Power Fantasy. Thank you. Good morning. I want to talk about how women yield power in terms of feminism. 
and I'm going to discuss how Alderman shows that female biology is not women's destiny. The power, over the power overturns the logic of patriarchal popular culture by imagining a future in which the powerful female body is literally electrified rather than sexualized. Extrapolating from the real ability possessed by electric eels, Alderman's novel takes place on an alternative earth where women suddenly develop skeins attached to their collarbones, which allow them to channel electricity through their hands. The women use electricity both to protect themselves and to cause bodily harm and even death. Their bodies become more powerful than men's bodies. The entire world shifts from patriarchy to matriarchy as a result of women inflicting the same physical violence against men that has been used against them. Alderman describes how three major protagonists respond to this change. Roxy, an unusually physically strong member of a British Jewish crime family, Ali, a sexualized, abused, mixed-race girl from the United States who becomes a re religious leader named Mother Eve, Margot, a powerful American senator, and Tund, a young male Niger Nigerian journalist who reports on the New World Women Rule. The power articulates what I call Alderman's Complaint, a Jewish feminist version of eloquent rage, which echoes Philip Roth's title, Portnoy's Complaint. Alderman's Complaint has three components. Challenging the gendered beauty ideals inherent in, Western, in the Western superhero tradition, showing the limits of early feminist science fiction's penchant violently to avenge the harm men have done to women, and articulating the atrocities Christians have inflicted upon Jewish bodies. Naomi Wolf describes the beauty myth as the tendency in modern Western culture to celebrate a very specific feminine ideal. Someone who is tall, thin, a blonde, and has a face without pores, symmetry of flaws, someone perfect. Alderman posits genre-specific versions of Wolf's description in The Power. She asks why female superheroes most fo focus on their hair and makeup. She questions why they should worry about the design of skin-tight superhero suits instead of concentrating solely on crime fighting. When the women of Alderman's world begin to explore their newfound powers, they also start to recover the story of previous female superheroes who functioned outside beauty myth tenants. As Alderman's female journalist, journalist tells viewers, ancient Israelites worshiped God's sister Anath as a female superhero, asking if they knew about what she, quote, was the warrior, that she was invisible, that she spoke with lightning, that in the oldest text, she killed her own father and took his place. She liked to bathe her feet in the blood of her enemies, unquote. Naturally, her male counterpart quickly attempts to turn Anath into a joke saying, quote, that doesn't sound much like a beauty regime now, does it, unquote. And yet it is precisely this model that women will eagerly embrace as they begin to create a new world order without the input of men. Alderman's celebration of intellectual and physical strength echoes the feminist speculative writers who began their careers in the 70s. Indeed, Alderman wrote the power under the mentorship of Margaret Atwood. Like Atwood, Alderman constructs her terrifying future societies by carefully researching and extrapolating from the past. Atwood famously said that all the atrocities perpetrated against women described in The Handmaid's Tale are based upon historical fact. Alderman reiterates a similar set of atrocities against women throughout the power. She emphasizes that the women of her world are drawn to their newfound powers because they allow them to stop the cycles of rape, sexual slavery, and child abuse in which they were previously entrapped. But Alderman's novel departs from its feminist predecessors in its pessimistic assessment of violent responses to patriarchy. This is particularly evident in her description of Bespara, the new women's country located in the former Eastern European region, which, which a Putin-like female despot controls. Although Bespara's leader speaks of freedom and autonomy, 
She earns the respect of female peers by publicly humiliating and mutilating her male attendants. She also encourages the rise of all female mountain cults that protect Bespara in exchange for the freedom to enact violent revenge on the men who have been who have oppressed them. For aldermen, the women's superpowered bodies cause the loss of their humanity. They have become electrified monsters, reduced to acting as mindlessly as electricity itself. Her condemnation of this so-called feminist utopia seems clear when Tun reports from Vespera on a building bombed by a terrorist group called Male Power and finds a pregnant woman trapped in the rubble named jo Joanna. Here it seems, Alderman suggests that new nonviolent feminist science fiction protagonists need to replace the cycles of, of violence 1970s feminist superheroes, such as Joanna Russ's violent jail perpetuate. Women subjecting men to the same horrific treatment they experienced only leads to the death of the very feminist futures they seek to establish. Thus, Alderman proposes a new answer for the feminist for feminist science fiction, which involves remaining human and humane by respecting the diversity of human bodies. Do I still have time? You've got three and a half minutes still. Okay, thank you. Um, but it is not just the women of Vespera who fail to create a truly feminine utopia. Two of Alderman's main characters fail similarly in their professional and personal lives. Senator Margot watches her brothers making believe they are they are spacemen. She decides that she didn't need a gun or a space helmet or a lightsaber. In the game Margot played when she was a child, she was enough by herself. And yet after male colleagues thwart her political plans, she justifies the violent use of electricity to secure her rise to power. As Margot becomes absorbed in the world of politics and she is increasingly skilled at using the tactics of the men who came before her, she makes a disastrous decision that leads to the death of her daughter. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to, to all four of our fantastic presenters today. Um, we have a little over 10 minutes to do Q&A. Um, so we invite people to, to add your questions to the Q&A. If for whatever reason you can't, we might, we might be having issues with that. Um, you can also, we will, we will allow you to put it in, in the chat as we, we deal with this. Um, yeah, or if the panelists have questions for each other either, um, yeah. Now's the time. Okay, so we have um, one question coming in um, from Josie Garza Medina. Um, and this one is for, um, this one's for Marlene. Um, is Alderman making a comment on the negation of holistic acts of femininity when women take on the violent reins of power of the state in the name of false feminism? I'm thinking of the electric powers as a symbol for use of electricity as torture device by female fascists at Ravensbrook, Abu Ghraib, and Guantanamo Bay. I'm going to put this in the chat so that you can see that too, because that is that is quite the question. Um, so yeah, I think that Alderman is speaking against the all female separatist utopias of the '70s and trying to have a more holistic version of feminism where violence is not the answer because there's a resolution at the end of the novel. And I think that she is trying to say that women are not limited by, by biology when she pictures women's bodies becoming electrified. And I wrote this paper before the current situation, and I have to say that electrified women's bodies are a defense mechanism. It's it's a defense mechanism because I I traveled to Israel and I was surprised to see young people walking around armed with guns. And the other day I saw young Jewish women in Los Angeles at a gun range. So 
I have a new reading of this novel now before I before I wrote my paper. So to answer the question, I I think that Alderman in the novel is trying to see a a more nonviolent solution because of the resolution at the end, which is almost like a Shakespearean play in that people come together after um after violence. But the new his the new situation in the world in reality is negating that vision because it has become necessary for Jews to arm themselves. Um, I see that Lee has her hand up. Wanna, I don't know how to allow people to speak. Oh, you've got it. Okay. Lee, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was actually going to put this in the chat, but thank you. Um, that was so interesting. I And this question is not fully formulated, but for um, the papers on Le Guin, which are really so interesting and fa fascinating, I was curious if either of you know, I mean, you mentioned, um, Sintan, you mentioned Taoism a little bit, and, and of course we know her interest in, in the Tao Te Ching and that she actually published a version, right? So I was just curious, has she written at all on, I mean, I know she's written on the Tao, but on specifically the Chinese language as something to that has influenced her as well? I mean, do, do you know much about, because of course of her interest in Taoism, I'm just wondering, since you brought up these, you know, translators from Chinese and Japanese, has she said and written anything specifically about um, these translations or responded? That's my question. Uh, to be honest, I don't have a broad overview of the, you know, the overall oeuvre of uh, uh, Laguin, but uh, Cynthia brought it up. Yeah, I, think. Yeah, I was yeah, asking I Cynthia too. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry for both of you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, the Chinese translation is very interesting because the translator actually addressed on uh, so many criticisms on the gender issues and to uh, respond to uh, those criticisms on behalf of the Green, she actually used quite a lot of tactics to uh, to emphasize the special sexuality in the Givinian society. For example, in the pronouns, sometimes when uh, we when we can use generic pronouns, she opt not to use generic pronouns when Jenny uh, uh it is associating some negative uh qualities of the Givinians to feminine qualities. So in that case, they would use like uh gender pronouns for female on purpose. And another tactic that she used uh, is to uh use italic form for uh for the pronouns he, she, uh, or the generic pronouns to emphasize that they are different from our understanding of gender. And that's, I think that's, it also comes to the background of the translator because the Taiwanese translator is actually a graduate of gender studies. Mm. So she's more aware of the whole situations, but uh, comparatively in Japanese version, it's just more stick to the original uh, stories that is uh, only a literal translation in most cases. Right. I hope that answers your questions. Yeah, and I was just thinking also, I don't know if you can still hear me. Um, yeah, I was just thinking also, I've thought about this a little bit, um, you know, her Le Guin's own background in German, which is yet another language, unlike English, that you have to gender everything, right? And, and other Latin rooted. So, so to think about, um, you know, her own sort of moving away or wanting to move away from that's so that's her her parental you know her her father's language right of the german and so it's interesting to think about those connections as well but yes thank you so much thank you and uh, it looks like we have one more question um in the chat um this one's for marlene from joanne orabak um, are there any ways that vengeance can be expressed in functional and useful ways in the novel bottling up the need for vengeance can be unhealthy I think that vengeance is unhealthy, both in the novel and in reality. Vengeance, vengeance only leads to more violence. And I think in reality and in the novel, there should be peaceful resolution. 
Thank you for that, Marlene. Um, are there any last minute questions? We have a couple minutes left. Um, Oh, we got one more in the chat. Um, this one's for Cynthia. Um, do you think it's better to stick to the original gendered language of the story during translation or approach it based on intent of the author like the Chinese translator you noted? Uh, thanks for the questions. It's an interesting one. I personally think that um, both have the uh, good points. Well, for the trans for the for the Chinese translations, it can help us to understand the world will better, more accurately. But at the same time, it's like uh, limiting the reader's ability of, of their own capacity to uh, explore the world will on their own. But uh, and I think we also have to see uh, the the publications time of the original work and also the uh, translated works because uh. The translated ones is more of recent publications, and that is after uh, so many recent discussions of the uh, pronouns and the gender issues. But but at the time when like we first published the novels, it was like a, a very good experiment on uh, asking what if we have uh, we we abandon gender altogether. So uh, the original work uh, is more uh, can better reflect uh, the nuance and also the originality uh, back in the Gwyn's time. So I think it's different. <laughs> so I don't know if that can, uh, that satisfies you. Thank you. Um, so I think, I think we're at a good stopping point so we can continue to be on time and start things on, you know, start things being on time and not uh, behind schedule this morning. I just want to say a big thank you to our four presenters this morning. This is a great way to start off our sci-fi symposium, such interesting topics. Um, I hope you all will stick around and join us. Um, I believe we have a, a break until 10.10 and then we start our next session. Please excuse me before it's over. I just must say hi to Chris, who is my friend in real life. Hi. I just Hi, nice to see you. I, I just, this Thanks is like everybody. my friend. I haven't seen him in years. And since all the questions <laughs> are done and all of the professional stuff is done, I just have to say, as a human being, even though this is Zoom, hi, Chris. Hi. <laughs> thank you for, thank Thanks. you for, Thanks, thank you for allowing that. Thank you. Oh, Thanks, Kel. Thanks, everyone. So, um, during the break times, we'll be putting the current panelists back to attendee, promoting the next set of panelists. And as Kel said, we'll get started at 1010. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. It was fun. I enjoyed it. Bye. Bye, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.